Welcome to the Cougar Tailgate, where BYU fandom lives. Here's your hosts, Sydney Carlson and Cole Wissinger. Good afternoon, Cougar fans. Like the man said, this is the Cougar Tailgate. My name is Cole Wissinger, and that over there is Sydney Carlson. We are back in cozy in our normal studio. Nothing to shake things up. We got to get focused mm-hmm. because this is the final stretch. And what a week. What a week to be watching Cougar basketball with a with a fun old number next to BYU's name this this week. How about that? Ranked in the AP poll for the first time since the Jimmer times. Since Jimmer years, yep. I'll be dang. Since I was a student here on campus. This time last week, it was Valentine's Day had just happened. We're entering into a President's Day long weekend, and BYU was playing San Diego. TJ runs it, lobs it to Yo oh, with a hammer! The alley of throwdown! And the Cougs with 11 seconds. Timeout taken. So BYU goes up 72 to 71 with 11.1 to go. And now, truly, the Cougars' one defensive series for the win. Spoiler alert. That defensive series went well. Final <laughs> score is 72 to 71. BYU victorious, but but way too dang close for comfort against oh, San Diego. This team loves to just make my heart stop. And yep, back to back games. We'll get to Santa Clara, but <laughs> USD. I just we were there was never any moment where I felt like yep we got it we got this in the bag. There was no control. <laughs> and it's funny because we we talked to. San Diego's play-by-play guy last week and he basically Mm -hmm. was saying like don't count San Diego out like this team is playing a lot better basketball and I'm gonna be honest dear listener I was like that sounds like lip service to me but he was he's a fan absolutely correct (laughs) turns out San Diego came out and was playing and you know BYU was in their backyard and and that home crowd Mm -hmm. once they got a taste of Ooh, this could happen. Yeah. They were loud. It feels like that's been BYU's downfall a little bit, too. Like, unless they are able to take a really strong lead and hang on to it, any kind of trip up in the rhythm of what they're doing really, uh, like, upsets their gameplay. And I think that's going to be something that they need to look at going forward is just, like, keeping your head down and staying in the game and not letting – you know, a couple missed shots or a couple good shots for the other team get to your head. Because... Kind of a lot of missed shots. So we Ugh. just got done bragging about how BYU had the best three-point percentage of any team in the entire country. And they right. still do. It turns out one game does not cannot sway things too much when you have a large enough sample size. Uh, freshman year statistics taught me that. But th- th- this one game was pretty bad. And especially that first half of right. this one game, BYU just could not get anything to drop. It it just kept feeling like we were that one three-pointer away from starting to run away. Mm-hmm. And it never happened. And they had to grit and grind all the way to the end of this game. It goes right back to that whole living and dying by the three situation we talked about last week. And unfortunately, there were too many times where BYU would step behind that three-point line. And the uh, anxiety that you felt as they went to take that shot was... Warranted. <laughs> but fortunately, when we say live or die, even when BYU died by the three, the death here is just a one-point victory. As, right. as Coach Pope has said a couple times, it's really awesome to be able to have teaching moments and still have and a W. And win, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, another, another thing that went into the San Diego game is as BYU was struggling from the three, San Diego was getting a lot of action down low. Yoli got into foul trouble really early on. You know, BYU still struggling through some injury issues as players rotate in and out of the lineup. And San Diego kind of had their way in the paint. They they out rebounded BYU thirty six to twenty seven. Their their field goal percentage down low where shots are easy was better because they were just taking more. It seemed like they could every time down the down the court, down the field, down the whatever it is that you play basketball on, they could just get down, stop, get it inside, one move, you're in. Right. And that's been the story in a lot of games this year, unfortunately, is that BYU has been dominated in the paint. And it things get better when you put Yoli on the floor. And obviously, we really struggled when we didn't have his size. But um, even still, it seems like that's an area that, you know, we <laughs> were a lot better typically behind the arc and not so much inside it. This And it just, um, it's going to be something that I think is going to plague this team if they don't look to overcome it. I agree. But 
there was another game this week where BYU's fortunes mm-hmm. behind the three, at least one particular BYU player's uh, sure. turn behind the three-point arc, uh, turned really well. Toulson out front. Everything well outside the basket right now for BYU. TJ beats his man to the paint, pulls up from 10 feet, shoots and scores again! Yeah. TJ Haas gives the Cougars a seven-point lead. 2.15 to go. Red-headed assassin. <laughs> Thank you, Mark Durant. He is, isn't he? Oh, boy. As as Greg Rubel alluded to, during the Santa Clara game, the Thursday night of this week, all of BYU's shots were well beyond the basket. They were shooting well from three-point, and they just kept going with that because that's what was working, and and the other mid-rangers weren't as well. Yeah. Well, there was a dime, I remember, from Yoli towards the like (laughs) in that end stretch. Yep. And I don't know if that crowd was any louder than after Yoli hit that three-point shot. There's something extra exhilarating big when, when one of your big guys threes. shoots a three. <laughs> so that was fun. Um, it seemed like the crowd at the Santa Clara game was a little confused about what was happening during that game. I mean, coming off of the San Diego game and having like a close matchup there, people, it just seemed they were like, wait, what's going on? Like, we, we we're, we're here for like... We're here for a 20-point lead. It just I don't know. The, the, the energy in that arena was pretty low right up until about five minutes to go when BYU finally was like, okay, enough of this. I, let's, let's get out of here. Let's get the win, like, and let's, let's look ahead. It was a tie game with less than half of the second half to go. Santa Clara yep. was right there the whole, the whole time. time. And it, mm-hmm. it was confusing because for this one, uh, peek behind the curtain, I was in this very building helping with the baseball broadcast with Jason Shepard on the call. And so as BYU was pulling out to a comfortable lead against Cal Poly in the seventh and eighth innings, I kept checking the BYU basketball score, seeing, you know, oh, it's only 10 at halftime. Yep. Oh, they're catching up. Oh, it is tied now. Oh, what is going wrong? And so uh, sometimes I would sneak out when I was, you know, if there's only one out, I knew we wouldn't go to break for a couple and I'd go peek my head around the corner and take a look at the game to see what is going on here. Right. Well, and even at halftime, like that 10 at halftime really was not indicative of what the rest of the game felt like. I, where I'm at, very focused on like in-game promotions and it was a fuller game than normal. And a couple times I was so focused on what was going to happen at the next time out that I wasn't even necessarily paying attention to what was going on. But I'd look up at the score and be like, wait, 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 why are we only up by two? It was happening so fast. And for the most part, like it was just neck and neck right up until, yeah, right up until it mattered, I guess. And then when it did, TJ really was the guy that helped it pull through. TJ driving Williams to the rim. Stop. Pop. Score! <laughs> TJ to the 10 for two, and the Cougs up nine. It's all TJ Haas. TJ freaking Haas. TJ freaking Haas indeed. Mark Durant <laughs> with the apt analysis because when you needed him to come through, right. they did start to go on that run and expand the lead just to the comfort zone and, and just to come out. You know, you look at the final score, 85 to 75. It's a 10-point win. That's about what you expect for Santa Clara. It's a little closer maybe, but but not representative of the close game it was the whole time to get there. Absolutely not. And that the end of that game dragged out Santa Clara was not gonna go out of there without a fight they were fouling our guys every chance they got and I yeah (sighs) like I think we had probably five or six stoppages in the last minute like it was it was it was very intense college basketball games normally take less than two hours this one almost two and a half because just that last five minutes real time yeah took a while that five minutes easily could have easily 20 to 30 minutes is very long <laughs> again i know because the baseball game ended up ending before yeah. <laughs> basketball post game which was not supposed that is to rare. happen when we were scheduling things as byu was wrapping up their second victory of the week the hard way gonzaga was taking the court for san francisco and as byu was finishing san francisco was keeping it tight in that game Gonzaga ended up going on runs as they do, but now BYU's focus turns squarely to that top team in the WCC, the number two team in the country. If you look at the AP, they fall from one for reasons that are beyond my yes. understanding because they've kept winning. Right. They're, they're an ordained number one seed into the NCAA tournament provided they continue to win. 
which BYU hopes will not be the case. And at the end of the day, you know what? The metrics, all that's fun, but this deal is about learning to win as a team. And these guys prove to themselves that they can they can go through a game where we're trying really hard. We just are kind of we just, we just can't quite find answers a lot. And these guys just gutted out and made huge plays. Seniors made huge veteran plays down the stretch to win a game, and and that adds belief. You know, as you go towards postseason, you're trying to take every shot that you can towards adding belief into your arsenal. And these guys add a little bit tonight. I'm super proud of them. Focus is on Gonzaga, so when we come back, we'll be speaking with their play-by-play man, Tom Hudson. Stay right here with the Cougar Tailgate. In case we haven't mentioned it, the number two team in the country is coming into the Marriott Center tonight. Be there. Welcome back into the Cougar Tailgate. I'm Cole Wessinger. If there is a single team in the WCC that BYU fans are, should be the most familiar with, it is the Gonzaga Bulldogs. They have the richest history and the most consistent success in this conference. Today, to help us learn a little bit more past the headlines of the Zags, it is their play-by-play man of the past 18 or so years, Tom Hudson. Welcome into the Cougar Tailgate, Tom. Hey, Cole, great to be here. Uh, I'm glad uh, you were able to reach out and we were able to, to connect. This is uh, going to be a whole lot of fun. We're looking forward to uh, the game tonight. Just uh, the great atmosphere that, that we always get in Provo when we come down for a game. Oh, and that's we've been talking on the show, and we're going to continue to a little bit, just all the fans that are around. They've been camping out since Thursday night when we got out of a, a Santa Clara game by the skin of our teeth. And, and honestly, that's, that's where I want to start here with you, too. Thursday looked a little hairy for y'all against San Francisco, too. As a play-by-play guy, do you get a little stressed on the call when it seems like every single game has got to be a win for you guys? And it, it ends it up being? Interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it is interesting, Cole, because, you know, we even talked about it uh, before the game on Thursday in our pregame show. You know, you look at a school like Duke, you know, they can go to North Carolina State and lose by 22, and it doesn't seem to be that big of a deal. But if we were to slip and lose a game, you know, like Thursday night maybe to San Francisco, who I think has a pretty good team, then all of a sudden it would be, you know, all the chatter that we've heard over the years, Gonzaga is no good and they can't beat anybody and they don't belong. And so, yeah, it does get a little bit stressful because you just feel like the margin for error for us uh, is uh, is pretty slim, you know, and, and that actually has been kind of fun to see where the league is with BYU playing so well and St. Mary's playing so well. You know, hopefully we'll get a little more uh, recognition maybe because it is uh, it is kind of hard feeling like every night, you know, you have to go into win games or it's really going to hurt, you know, kind of your national reputation. So, uh, yeah, it does uh, it does get a little stressful. I think everybody in the kennel on Thursday night was kind of looking around saying, wait a second, we, we, do, we don't lose here very often. What the heck's going on? <laughs> Well, and yeah, that game was played in the McCarthy Athletic Center, the kennel. Um, can you give us a little history of that wonderful arena and just what kind of environment it is for one of the best teams in college basketball? Well, you know, Cole, it's it's a great building, and it's uh, it's really kind of neat how it all came about. You know, we played in the in the Martin Center um, a, for years and years, and then when we made that run uh, to the Elite Eight way back in 1999. Um, there's some people on campus who decided that, you know, maybe it was time for us to, to build a new arena. So, you know, the old kennel was about 3,000 seats, 3,500 seats. And, uh, you know, we built the McCarthy Athletic Center. There's 6,000 seats now, and it's really a state-of-the-art building. You know, the locker rooms are fantastic. Um, you, you know, the atmosphere in there is really great. Uh, the one thing that they did a nice job of was, you know, they kept the students right on the sideline. Um, and mm-hmm. so, you know, they're, they're right there kind of in the players' faces, and there's a lot of noise and uh, you know, so it, the, the atmosphere still feels really great. So it's it's fun. I mean, we've been so good in that building. I think last night or, or Thursday night, I mean, when we when we won that game, I think we're now 222 and 15 since we opened the McCarthy Athletic Center in Something. 2004. So we we don't lose there very often. It's, it's a great home court advantage, and it's it, it really is. You know, I, I always tell the visiting radio guys because we always talk before games. You know, just kind of swap stories and, mm-hmm. and talk about how our teams are doing. You know, you say, hey, when our students are, are here and they're, they're raucous and they're, you know, they're really into it, it is as fun as atmosphere uh, as you'll find out there. You know, and, uh, and actually BYU, honestly, is one that I always, you know, try to compare to. I said, now, BYU is different because it's, you know, three times the people that we have. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it is. When, when it gets going, uh, it is uh, one heck of a fun place uh, for a basketball game. It's just a great environment. And, 
Uh, and like I said, they, they did a great job of building the building. And for us, it was kind of interesting because, you know, we're not that big a school. You know, I mean, our, I, I think our attendance are, 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 right enrollment. now, we're, yeah. we're in the yeah, enrollment. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I was thinking attendance in the, in the kennel. Which we're talking basketball. Thousand, but yeah, our enrollment, yeah. <laughs> The enrollment is about 8,500 undergrad. I think we're around 6,000. And so, you know, they didn't want to try to build a big, huge, you know, 12 or 15,000 seat arena. They wanted to keep it, uh, you know, in kind of context of, of, you know, the size of our school. And, and to be honest, we've sold out every time since uh, the building's been open. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a great demand here. And so that makes it fun being around town. That, you know, if you get to go to a Gonzaga game, it's a, it's a really special deal. It, it's a special event. And you get that feel when you're inside the building. Do the fans and, and the student section especially have any, like, unique things that they do during the game? Like, is there a, a like, chant that they have or songs that they get along to? Yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting because, uh, you know, we, we've got this stuff, you know, the pregame stuff I think a lot of people are doing now, you, you know, which, uh, you know, we've got uh, Zombie Nation is a big one for us. And then, you know, they've got a couple other songs that they kind of, you know, roll in and out. And mm-hmm. you know, it, it has been interesting because we, we've had some traditions over the years. And then I think, you know, stuff kind of moves back and forth a little bit, which, which is kind of interesting. And I, I think they're, they're maybe trying to find a, a few more, uh, you know, kind of deals that, that they can really hang their hat on. Because it is, you, you know, like I said, when the students are, are into it, it is so much fun. And, uh, you know, they're loud. And, and the game on Thursday night against San Francisco, you know, for us, it's a little bit different than a BYU because the the student section is right on the floor. And so, you know, guys are inbounding the ball and, you know, you've got, you know, everybody kind of pointing at them and waving their fingers. And yeah, it, it's been phenomenal. I, you know, I mean, BYU has had more success than anybody in our building. You know, of, of those 15 losses, BYU's given a, three of them to us. <laughs> you know, you, you do the math and uh, that's uh, that, that's a pretty impressive uh, percentage it is. for the Cougars to come in here because uh, not a lot of teams have been able to come in here and win. So right there, right when it opened, though, that, that middle 2000s chunk, that was when Adam Morrison was there. Um, you were opening the new arena. Why don't you just, like, walk us through some of the All-American names, some of those those players that you've gotten to know over the years that have played for Gonzaga? Well, you know, it was really neat because that was kind of the time where, where Gonzaga was establishing itself. You know, we, we made those, those couple of runs in the late 90s and the early 2000s, and then we opened up the building, and there was kind of a new wave that came through. And like you talked about, Adam, who actually is, is my color analyst, he's been with me now for oh, three no years. Way. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been great. And uh, he moved back to Spokane when his playing career was over. And so, uh, yeah, he's, he's been with me now. Like I said, this is his third season, so that's been awesome. Um, but, you know, that those were really fun years there. And, and actually, you know, the West Coast Conference Tournament uh, back then, they tried for a little bit to rotate sites every year to, to play it on a, on a home campus. Mm-hmm. And so we actually, uh, in, in Adams Jr. year, which was 2006, we hosted it. We had two games where we had to rally to win. And uh, just the environment in there was so, so crazy. It was so much fun. And so we won two close games, and the fans were going crazy. And uh, and that was fantastic. And then, it, you know, it just it kind of carried on. And, and I think that was one of the biggest things about building that new arena was, you know, when, when our, our streak started in 1988, 1999, and then in 2000, you know, a lot of the kids that we were recruiting were, you know, kind of kids that, that had a chip on their shoulder. You know, maybe were overlooked a little bit. Um, and then, you know, with the, the new building and the new, you know, facilities and, you know, all the shiny stuff that kids like these days, uh, <laughs> you know, now we've gotten to a point where, you know, we've been able to recruit higher level kids. We got a kid by the name of Micah Downs who uh, was a McDonald's All-American who started his career at Kansas who came and played for us. And, you know, we had other kids, Jeremy Pargo and uh, Josh Heifel, and that team was really good. They came through in 2009, a, a lot of talent, Matt Bolden. Um, and then it's, it just kind of has, has continued to grow from there. And, you know, if you watch the NBA at all, I don't, honestly. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, I just know our guys who are playing. You know, DeMontis Sabonis uh, is uh, an NBA All-Star. Oh, yeah. He played his first All-Star game. And then Rui Hachimura and Brandon Clark from last year, those guys both, both played in the Futures game. And, you know, Kelly Olenek uh, has been playing. He actually played – uh, he was on our team uh, that played against BYU when uh, uh, Jimmer and, uh, and company beat us in the NCAA tournament. You know, mm-hmm. Kelly's still playing for Miami. Um, Jack Collins, who played for us in the national championship game team, uh, he's playing for Portland right now. I tell you, we are actually uh, next uh, Thursday, so our next game after, uh, after tonight, mm-hmm. uh, are going to hang uh, Adam's number in the rafters. Oh, that's and, nice. And uh, so he'll go up there, yeah, next to John Stockton, who uh, I'm sure most of, uh, most of you There we go. Know. I wasn't going to uh, let you yeah. stop before we got to the name that yeah. our Utah fans are going to recognize. Yeah, John exactly. Stockton went to Gonzaga. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and uh, so Adam Summer will be up with him and Frank Burgess, who played for us in the 60s at our school's all-time leading score and actually – became a federal court judge. So, you know, Adam's number is going up there with some select company, you know, one of the top 50 players of all time. And 
you know, and a guy who came out of nowhere to, you know, to become one of the, the best in the world at what he does. So it's really exciting. And it's, it's funny because I was talking with uh, one of our newspaper writers last night. He was asking me to uh, talk about, you know, some of my favorite stories about Adam. And it's funny mm-hmm. kind of going down memory lane. And, uh, you know, you think about all the things that, that happened when Adam was playing and how much fun it was and how exciting it was. You know, every time you went to, to the kennel, Cole, I mean, you didn't know. I mean, Adam might go and score 50. I mean, yeah. you had no idea. It was that much fun. There was so much anticipation every night. And that was a, a great, great time in Gonzaga basketball history. And I, I was really fortunate to be there for that. That was, uh, you know, a few years into to my tenure. And, and I also got to see Adam play in high school. He was a Mead high school kid from right here in Spokane. And so, you know, it was fun to see that happen. And to be honest, it's been really cool from, you know, seeing him as a high school kid to becoming the nation's leading scorer in college. And now he's moved back to Spokane, and I get to work with him on the radio and and gotten to know him a little bit better. So it's been a whole lot of fun for me to be able to do that. I I love hearing those stories. And we got some of the players. You guys have one of the preeminent coaches in all of college basketball as well. As the radio guy, you get to get to know Mark Few a little bit closer than I think everyone else. As a BYU fan, I'll be honest with you. I I see his face and it gives me nightmares because I just, I associate it with that, that brooding on the sideline, you know, getting in everyone's face and then normally ending up with the BYU loss. But like, what's Mark Few the guy like? Well, you know, Coach Few is great. And Cole, I'll share a story from a few years ago when Please. we were uh, in 2017, when we made it to the national chip chip game against North Carolina. And, you know, there had been so much talk about him and what his career meant, you know, a few years prior to that. So we went to the Elite Eight that first year in 1999, and we hadn't been back. And in 2015, uh, you know, we, we made it, and everybody was kind of, you know, there was all the monkey on your back and, you know, all of that talk, like, you know, hey, are, are you, you know, a good coach, really, because you've never been to the Elite Eight? You know, a lot of that stuff was going on. So, you know, so we made it there, and then, you know, two years later, we made it to the Final Four, and, and he was asked again that same question, kind of, okay, does this validate your career, and does this make, uh, you know, your career complete, and, and, you know, what does this say about you? And, and you know, Coach had a, the, one of the greatest responses I've ever heard. He said, you know what, he's like, I grew up the son of uh, a minister who led his church for 50 years. He said, I've got a lot bigger things to, to live up to and, and a lot more important things to worry about, uh, you know, than my legacy as a basketball coach. You know, he said, uh, you know, obviously this is great, and, and he's as competitive a guy as I know. Mm-hmm. You know but he really put it in perspective and said, hey, you know what? Like, I, this, this is more important than, than just the basketball. Like, my life is not going to be any more full, you know, having won you know, a, a few basketball games in a row in March as compared to, you know, the other things that I have. You know, family is extremely important to him. And like I said, you know, living up to, to his dad and what his dad was able to do and how many things, you know, he did to help other people. So I, I think that gives you a little bit of insight into him because it, it's a neat thing to see, and it, and it is fun to see with all the – the high stakes and, and all the pressure, and you see these guys in, in those situations. It, it is fun, uh, Cole, to, to be able to see it behind the scenes a little bit and, and see, you know, kind of the human beings behind, like you said, the guy that you see on the sideline that uh, that gets fiery uh, <laughs> at times, to say the very least. Yeah, I thank you so. Much. That's that's the kind of insight I was looking for because you know there's a guy behind it, and and I love hearing those stories, and I think it's kind of indicative also to that small town college environment that. He, he can be a celebrity to all the people around, but he's still, you know, just a dude. You want to take us just a little bit more into Spokane? Um, what's what's the town like and, and what's the feel? Maybe, like, what's one of your favorite restaurants up there for the next time BYU's uh, in town for a game? Well, I tell you what, you know, Cole, the, the neat thing about Spokane, you know, it's a blue-collar town, and this Gonzaga program couldn't have kind of personified this city anymore. Uh, than that group that came up and made this whole thing start, uh, you know, back. And I was actually, before I was on radio, I was working in TV. Uh, and so I was uh, here and, and covering that uh, that run to the Elite Eight in 1999. And it was unbelievable. I mean, banners everywhere and, you know, pep rallies and, you know, thousands of people showing up, uh, you know, for the send-offs to, to send you to the airport, you know, on the yeah, way to go yeah. and play in, in a tournament game. I mean, they just caught the imagination of this city. And like I said, they personified everything that, that our, our city is about. And, uh, you know, now, I mean, it's, you'd be hard-pressed to, to go around town and not see somebody wearing a Gonzaga shirt. It is uh, really taking over this community. And, and again, you know, Coach Few does such a great job. You know, our guys are involved in the community up here. Uh, you know, they, they visit kids in hospitals, and, and, you know, and they do a lot of things. And a lot of it's behind the scenes. Coach Few doesn't do any of that stuff to, to get – you know, any kind of publicity or, you know, to say, hey, look at me or, hey, look at my guys, here's what they're doing. They do so much of behind the scenes that, that nobody ever knows about. And, 
And, you know, from time to time, you'll be walking around town and somebody will stop me and, and share a story of, oh, hey, you know, gosh, Coach View, they came into this and what a wonderful thing it was for us. So, you know, they, they have really taken over uh, this town and, and our players understand it. You know, they, they get a, a wonderful feeling for how much, you know, they mean uh, not just to Gonzaga, but to our entire community. So it is, it, it's, uh, it's a really special relationship between GU uh, and Spokane. And, and boy, talk about restaurants. I mean, we've got some good ones coming in here, Cole. It, it has been uh, really neat to see. Spokane is really on the rise here over the last couple of years. Uh, we've had a couple of, um, of guys that uh, uh, are James Beard Award winning chefs. Uh, a couple of guys who were actually from Spokane that have moved back here and opened up places. One of them was on, and, and I'm going to, my wife works for Visit Spokane, which is like our Chamber of Commerce, and I should know something. Oh, awesome. She's going to kick me when I, when I don't remember the names of the restaurant. But, you know, on one of the cooking shows uh, that he did really well, and he came back to Spokane, and they've opened up some restaurants. And so we've got some really good ones. I, I have a favorite I've been going to for 25 years. It's up on the South Hill. It's called Hogan's. It's a, it's a little diner. It's a 50 style, you know, and I've known the owner forever, and uh, it's, a, it's a great spot. I love going there. And then downtown, you know, there's just, like I said, there's a lot of stuff that's opened. There are a lot of things. Uh, that are going on. I, I laugh. I have an eight-year-old and a six-year-old now, so uh, you know our our, <laughs> our our dining tastes have uh, have moved a little bit. You also and, have a McDonald's there, choice, right? Like with a with a play place. Yes. <laughs> yep, and we do have that. As a matter of fact, we were debating between that and donuts uh, when we uh, <laughs> when we went out before I left town, and so. Um, but yeah, there are there are a ton of great restaurants here, and gosh, I, I should have a few of those in my back pocket that I remember, but. Uh, it, it really is. Well, it, it's a neat city, and it's really, uh, like I said, I think it's up and coming. I've been here for 25 years. I'm a, mm-hmm. I'm a Texas guy, and I moved here because I'd never been in the Northwest. And I thought I'd come and work for a few years and go back home. And You're still uh, 25 there? 25 years later, yeah, I'm, I'm still here. I, I've set down roots, and it's, uh, it's a special community. It's, uh, it's a fun place. You know, it's just big enough that we get a lot of things going on here, but it's also just small enough that we don't have a ton of traffic. You know, getting to the airport's really easy. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but, you know, the flip side is, you know, we get the majority of the, the Broadway plays and most of the concerts come through. And, you know, we've got a great symphony. Uh, and they've got a home, the Fox Theater, which is just a beautiful, beautiful place. So there, there's a lot of good stuff going on in this town. It's that perfect middle ground. All right, Tom, you got me convinced. I, I like you too much right now. Let's talk about the game. All right. Okay. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> what do you think? It's my last question always when I talk to folks. Um, what What's going to happen tonight? Give me give me a little bit of insight, just briefly. You know, I, I think one of the biggest things is going to be for us, and we've talked about this throughout the year. You know, we've we've had a great year, obviously, um, but you know, we lost so many players from last year's team, and we had four guys that you know, two of them are in the NBA, two other guys who signed NBA contracts, and then two seniors who were really good. So you know, we lost six guys from our team, and we've got a lot of new faces. Some of them are grad transfers that are older, but you know, kind of some of our questions this year have been, okay these guys have never been into this environment. How are they going to respond to that? And, and you can't explain, I don't think uh, BYU and what it is and going into the Marriott center and 19,000 people and the noise and, and everything that goes on there. Uh, just the game day, like I talked about before, it is as good a game day experience as we ever see. I, I, I mean, we love it. You know, being on the radio where, where we, you're not judged on whether or not we win or lose, you, know, you go in <laughs> and you're looking around and you're like, Hey man, this is really it's cool. Fun. But, you know, I, I think I, I think that'll be one of the, the questions: is how do our guys handle uh, the environment? It's it's going to be fun to see, you know. And hopefully for us, Killian Killy's uh, going to be okay. And he's been battling a, an ankle injury, and he's such a, a good player for us. Uh, he played on Thursday night and scored 22 points, but mm-hmm. he didn't play at Pepperdine, you know. So he's he's played. He's missed nine games so far this year, kind of with just you know a few injuries. So the poor kid has been. He's been beat up his entire career and such a yeah. shame because he's such a nice, uh, nice young man and you really root for him. But, um, you know, if he's playing, I, I think it makes for a really fun game. If if not, you know, we're a six person rotation. And, and so Oof. at times that can be you know, a little bit problematic, not a whole lot of rest. So uh, I think there are a couple of uh, things to watch. But I think for us, Cole, you know, to see how we handle kind of the uh, a the initial you know, excitement and an initial surge. And then what happens if BYU makes a couple of runs? How, how do we handle that? Two ranked teams are going head-to-head in the Marriott Center tonight. Tom Hudson just let us a little bit behind the curtain of the Gonzaga side of things. Thank you so much for coming on the Cougar Tailgate today. Hey, Cole, absolutely. It's great talking to you. When we come back, we'll talk about how The Rock, the BYU fans, are preparing for tonight's game. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back 
welcome to the Cougar Tailgate. My name is Cole Wessinger, and sitting right over there is Sydney Carlson. How are you today? I am great. There's a lot going on this week, and we are here to talk about it. It's a busy Saturday. <laughs> uh, there's There's Very been busy. some sports we mentioned already. I was helping broadcast some baseball. They're in the middle of a series. Men's volleyball has taken off, uh, as they always as do. As they always do. <laughs> and then... There is, of course, basketball and the rock student section here at BYU spread pretty thin trying to get to all the events, but yeah. they are focused on the number two team in the country facing off against BYU's number 23. We thank again Tom Hudson coming on from Gonzaga's media team to help us get to know Gonzaga a little bit better. And he talked about the kennel. We've got the rock and it is going to be rocking at the Marriott Center tonight. Oh, 100%. It's our first official sellout before we actually even get to the game. Fun fact, listener. Wow. Um, so, and I think it might be the first official sellout pregame since I started working at the athletic department three years ago. So th- there's an excitement around this game and this team that has been lacking for a while. And I think it's really exciting to see the success that this team has had under Mark Pope in his first year, like, that's pretty rare. Let's remind you there, yeah. Yeah, like, it's, but it's so cool, and um, on my drive over here, yeah, I already saw. <laughs> the tangible manifestation. The, the tangible, yeah, exactly. The actual the ener- the energy and the, the cries of cold coming from hundreds of students. Lined From up in tents. tents. <laughs> so, so to give you an idea, the Marriott Center sits right next door to the broadcasting building, as a matter of fact. And as of Thursday night, after Santa Clara, after BYU beats Santa Clara, tents start popping up. And by Friday morning, there is a line that kind of starts stretching down, heading toward campus. Mm-hmm. And as as people have gotten in and and the line has extended it's all the way across the bridge right now if you know BYU's campus at all there are quite a few students that are willing to brave the cold provo winter 16 degrees i think oh, is what it was no. a couple nights ago intense to get good seats for this uh, this Gonzaga game sydney you ever you ever sleep in a tent in 16 degree weather to watch I a basketball game cannot say i have i had the great fortune of as a student working in sports. Yeah. So I pretty much had a seat somewhere to watch the game. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, no, I didn't have to camp out in a tent. It's an Plus. experience. <laughs> I, I don't think they have to either. I, if, if I'm no, trying to get to. in the mind of the kind of person that would sleep in a tent. Because, honestly, there is no scenario that I would want to be in a tent. There were... I, uh, folks are folks are bemoaning the demise now of the Boy Scouts. I am celebrating. I my <laughs> parents tried to get me to do the dang Scouts three separate times. I've like enrolled as a tenderfoot and done the little like physical fitness test or whatever you do the uh-huh. first week of scouting three separate times. Never made it to whatever comes after tenderfoot star Couldn't tell or class first class second class eventually there's an eagle in there i am i am three times a tenderfoot and have never gone on a proper camping trip because i just didn't want to i that is not my style and so i but if i was gonna Listen, do it they it have would ticks probably... and stuff in pennsylvania i don't blame you it is and it's cold there too <laughs> and you know it's the outdoors <laughs> who wants to be outside when i could be inside watching a basketball <laughs> game honestly when i could be inside watching a game for my own television too to escape the dynamics of having to dibs your seat in the stadium but but i get it right yeah it's more the fact that you were in that line and you'll be able to tell your kids someday that the time byu knocked off number two gonzaga yep uh, i was in the line of tents it's 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 almost goes beyond sports i'm finding out so i was talking to one of our uh, one of our rock board members earlier today, and he was talking about how they've had to move the tents a couple times. Yeah. It's been a whole situation, but he said he ran into a girl that was like, so I haven't really been following the basketball team. Like, are they, <laughs> how have they been doing? And he's like, I'm sorry, you're sleeping in this tent and you don't follow basketball. And she's like, yeah, I just thought it would be fun. <laughs> so like, there's a little bit of like a, Hey, this is a college experience that I want to have. And I want to be out here with my friends and we can sit here and Laugh about the good times when we right. when we were sleeping in sixteen degree weather, and hopefully they hopefully it pays off for them in some way. 
the cool thing about the Marriott Center is they're going to have a good time yeah, no matter what once true. they get in there. But BYU is not the only college campus across the nation that gets excited for college basketball to the point of insanity, you might say, to want to sleep in tents. Uh, shish, oh, oh, I practiced this too and I already – Shishevskyville. <laughs> Coach K, Kville, yeah, yeah, over in Duke, um, they have they have tents every time they do UNC, and they they kind of have to schedule. The most fun I had looking into this was seeing the like rules and regulations of how they mm. manage tents because we're we're dealing with it right now this week too. Absolutely, we have very similar rules, I'm <laughs> sure. But yeah, and so it's so it's a whole big deal for the Cameron Crazies of Duke when they set up the hundreds of tents that. Uh, for for months at a time, you have to have like a certain number of people in the tent per mm-hmm. night, per day. Coach K will sometimes come by after practice. He'll bring everyone pizza. That's cool. It's it is an environment there in Duke. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. I we've done that from time to time. I think, um, true story. I think a little bit our facilities team has tried to not discourage, but like also not encourage students to be intense so <laughs> well let's rewind it back to the beginning of the football season the whole idea of the rock line was yep. kind of uh, pulled back on a little bit so that they could do the cougar canyon thing and right. we're giving you a place to go be crazy and have your college experience without the potential for chaos is high yeah. when you have people <laughs> trampling intense, trampling pushing shoving Black elbowing. friday scenario yeah absolutely so i think they try to keep it a little more low-key but i do i mean i love the idea of like a coach coming by and thanking them for being there and supporting but um yeah it's 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 an experience and it's fun to see I, I remember back in Jimmer senior year there were lines every game it wasn't just it wasn't just the Gonzagas or the Utahs it was every game because being able to see Jimmer live live was yeah was worth that and so it's fun to see that that kind of excitement has returned to the Marriott Center and I hope it translates to a very loud arena tonight. That's right. That's the number 23 team going against number two. So the Rock, it is your job. And everyone else that fills the other 18,000 seats in that stadium to yeah. give them a good environment to play the game. There's a couple other like weird uh, football traditions about like gathering for the game that I thought were kind of noteworthy here as well. Ole Miss has the Grove, uh, which is their place where they do their tailgating beforehand. And um, my personal favorite is the University of Cal Berkeley has mm-hmm. what is called Tightwad Hill, which is just right up my alley, mm-hmm. where their their stadium is kind of down built in a valley of sorts. Yeah. And there's a hill that goes up above it where you can actually kind of sit up there for free. It's Tightwad Hill and sort of see what's happening on the field down there. Like it's the, the so nosebleediest funny. seats you can possibly imagine that you just sit on the hill outside the stadium to kind of try to watch the game. And it becomes a whole environment where, you know, people, it, it lends itself to parties as college atmospheres kind of do. But that's it's another place where kids gather for sporting events uh, around, you know, the, the things around sports. That's Tightwad so Hill. I love Cal that. Berkeley. That's so... <laughs> It's a great name. I don't remember. I'm trying to remember. We went and saw when uh, BYU played Jared Goff in yep. <laughs> played against some Cal Berkeley. We were at that game, and I'm trying to remember. Like, I remember the valley of it all, but I would have loved to just like call over, call over to Tightwad Hill. Hey. <laughs> There are every every student section, every college basketball place has their thing. And so, uh, before we we head out, I want to give you a little quiz because Great. some of these are just they're so <laughs> they're so cleverly named that if you think think about it, you'll be able to figure oh, it out. Ooh, okay, well, but I don't think you will. I because, didn't study for this quiz. <laughs> I just want everyone to know. There are there are some fun ones. We'll start easy. The kennel is Gonzaga. Right. There's also a dog pack, so it's another... Uh, no, that is the wolf pack, but dog are. pack? The name of the student section, it's a team we played in football this year. Oh, no. Go back and like run through the mascots in your head. <laughs> the Utes don't have a dog. Nope, nope. The Aggies don't have a dog. At home, we played them at home? Or on the, the road? There was a home game. Oh, it was an away game last year. Goodness. In the pack name? twelve, oh, their little dog wears a purple Washington. cape. Washington, the Huskies. The Huskies. They're the dog pack. That makes sense. I have 
conveniently blocked that game out from my memory. How about the Who Crew? Ooh, ooh, ooh. There's a BYU tie-in here as well if you See, I want to say it's like... It. It, uh, see, it makes me think of like a military school. Hoorah. Maybe. No, it's not. Ah. So the the Virginia... Oh, yep. Cavaliers. That makes sense. Who Rock crew? Mendenhall. Um, how about how about the Oakland Zoo is the name for the section of students you'd think would be in Berkeley, Oakland, so one of those, one of the Bay Area schools, right? Yeah. Nope, not all. There's a there's a little town right outside Pitt in Pennsylvania <laughs> called Oakland, and that's where the stadium actually is. So the Oakland Zoo is the Pitt Panthers student section. All right. Just because I wanted to give an extra curveball. Uh, here's one that my personal favorite color commentaryist in all of college basketball would enjoy. Bill Walton might be a fan of the Grateful Red. Oh, there's so many teams <laughs> that are red. Yeah, just start naming. Uh, so just... that's, that's Wisconsin. Oh, okay. They're the Grateful. And they wear, it's like all red themed, but they wear tie dye red shirts oh, in that's their cool. student section. How about so we talk about Shashevskyville? Got it. Mm-hmm. Uh, is you? named after Coach Mike Shashevsky. <laughs> the Izone is the student section where oh. named after Tom Izzo, their coach. You are asking me to pull out some deep NCAA history from my brain. <laughs> One of the perennial uh, teams that's at the top of the Big Ten. They're currently fourth in the BPI, despite (laughs) not even being ranked. Yeah, Michigan State. So so they named their eyes after their coach as well. How about the Nut House? The Nut is. Would someone actually have a squirrel as a mascot? Is that is that the tie-in? You're thinking that you're clever. Nah, it is the Ohio State Buckeyes. No, because the Buckeye is a little nut. No, I hate that. (laughs) And they call themselves the Nut House. Get out of here, the Ohio State. (laughs) The Rowdy Reptiles would, of course, be. One of those, Gators, like, yep, Florida? the F- University of Florida ha, Gators. I got one. Uh-huh. There it is. Uh, locally around here, how about the herd? You familiar with that one? The herd is Utah State. Yeah, it is. And they have, as as I was looking up the different things, they're one of many schools that claim to have started uh, after it was a thing in soccer. The I believe that we go yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Thing. You can, you can. Uh... You can keep that to yourselves, the herd. <laughs> but they, they are not the only one. That there there was another school that tried to like trademark it and yeah, gosh. I thought I've been seeing it crop up in all Utah State things. So yeah, that's that's just some of the creatively punny names that go along with college basketball student sections. I'm partial to the rock. Roar of Cougars. I am old enough to remember when we the rock was created. Whoa! What was the what was like the the idea behind it? Do you know any of that? Like there actually used to be a rock that the students or not the students, oh like a but, rock R O C K rock like uh-huh. a rock rock okay yeah so when they started it I mean it was always roar of cougars but they would bring out they may still have it it was mostly at Lavelle Edwards Stadium but all the players would hit it on their oh, way out of those the like tunnel. ceremonial like yeah. touch the rock before mm-hmm. yeah so it was like a double meaning gotcha. there was a rock and the rock. Yep. Honey, I love it. Well, that is a peek inside the different student sections across the country um, as we applaud the dedicated students here locally at BYU that are camping out in preparation for making the Marriott Center as loud as humanly possible for the game later tonight between BYU and the Gonzaga Bulldogs. When we come back, we're going to take a look back for a second at that Santa Clara game that happened on Thursday with a member of their broadcast team, uh, a member of the student radio team, as a matter of fact, for Santa Clara. He'll tell us a little bit more about the Broncos when we come back. Back into the Cougar Tailgate. My name is Cole Wissinger, and right over there, Sydney Carlson. Earlier this week, before we got focused on Gonzaga, you got to take one game at a time, and it was Santa Clara, and the guys took care of business. But right before that game, Thursday morning, I had a chance to sit down with their student play by play man, Spencer McLaughlin. Here's that conversation. <laughs> 
when talking the history of Santa Clara basketball, it really starts and ends with one particular All American that you had to go through there. Yeah, he has a a large banner in the Levy Center that will forever remain, and he was responsible for the the last trip to the NCAA tournament for Santa Clara. He led them to that March Madness Dance 3. It was four years. Um, His name was Steve Nash. You might have heard of him. Yep. (laughs) Went on to have a a pretty prolific NBA career. and Two-time league MVP, all-star, what, eight or nine seasons? Pretty okay. He's okay. Yeah, yeah, he, he turned out to be a pretty good player, and you know, I think it's just a testament to the idea that some guys just need a chance to play and show themselves, and not everyone's got that one or two, you know, noticeable characteristics that you know, certain coaches looking for. But you just need a chance to play, and then mm-hmm. you can you can go on and, and do anything. I mean, you look at guys who come out of the West Coast Conference. I mean, people might think it's it's a mid major, doesn't produce a lot of NBA guys, and you know, doesn't have a nationally relevant team. But then you look at teams like Gonzaga and St. Mary's, and they're in the tournament every year, winning games, competing. And, you know, BYU is certainly in that mix this year as well. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I I think it's just really awesome to watch a a conference like that grow into something where you have that many competitive teams. And you maybe don't have the the resources and the name brand recognition that, that a lot of Power Five conferences do. Yeah, I mean, BYU wasn't even in the WCC when Steve Nash was playing, but I still count right. it as a point of pride for our conference now that guys yeah. like Steve Nash, and when I talk to the San Francisco Dons fellow, you got Bill Russell coming out of there. Like, we have these names yeah. that have been in the WCC conference over the years, and, and it proves that we're established as well. Yeah, and Bill Russell, I think, is a name that nobody thinks about when they think of the West Coast Conference, for for casual fans at least. I mean, they know Bill Russell if you're a basketball fan, of course, because Bill Russell. (laughs) (laughs) If you're a basketball fan, you don't know who Bill Russell is. You're probably not that much of a basketball fan. And I don't think a lot of people realize that he was at San Francisco and that they were winning national championships. And, you know, it's it's the same Don school that that we play against every year. And uh, it is a testament, uh, once again, to to what – what the West Coast Conference can produce. I agree. Any other Santa Clarins that casual fans might recognize? Or even if they don't, you want to educate us a little bit about what all, uh, other guys that have come out of the school over the years? Well, I, I think the, the most notable alum recently for the basketball team has been Jared Brownrich. And he is playing in the G League right now for the Philadelphia 76ers. And uh, I remember watching him as a freshman. He was a senior that year. But I remember watching him in you know, he plays 40 minutes a game regularly, which is Oof. impossibly difficult to do. And he was running around off screens the entire game. The entire defense was trying to focus in on him, but he would just hit tough shot after tough shot. And, you know, I, I met him a couple of times. I know it was always his dream to play in the NBA, and he's really not that far off. I mean, he led the G League in three-pointers made last season, and he continues to... To, to put up strong performances time and time again for him. And the Sixers are a team that could maybe use another shooter or two off the bench. And I really don't think it's out of the realm of possibility at all within the next year or two or three or whatever for Brownridge to get the call up to the NBA. And, you know, I think that'd definitely be a point of pride for, for Santa Clara. And I, I think Jerry would have earned it. We are getting ready for a basketball game tonight, but what are some of the other sports on campus that Rough Riders, the fans, uh, get excited for? Well, the, the biggest one outside of men's basketball is, is women's soccer. Uh, our women's soccer team is the most successful sport on campus by, by winning percentage and, and national relevance. I mean, they're in and out of the, the top 25 just about every single year. They've been to their March Madness tournament. Uh, you know, at the end of the year, each of the last four or five years, they, they made it to the Elite Eight a couple of years ago. They mm-hmm. were in the Sweet 16 this year, uh, you know, and ultimately ended up ended up losing in that round. But, uh, I mean, they're, they're a nationally relevant program, and they're the last, uh, I, I believe they're the last Santa Clara team to win a national championship at the Division One level. That was in the early 2000s, and you know, they, they lock and reload every single year, and they've always got good players. And, 
They've, they've got a couple of prominent alums as well. Julie Ertz, the uh, the wife of Zach Ertz and star of the U.S. Women's National Oh, you team. betcha. Like, she she went to Santa Clara and played her soccer here. And, no way. Uh, that, that, yeah, yeah. That that program is really uh, is it, is really strong, and I, I don't think you know arguably the best on campus. I think you can just say it, it is the best and and most successful on campus. And uh, you know, they've, and they've got good crowds. They, they always do. I mean, you know, that's kind of how it works in college sports. Is if you win, then people then people show up. And women's soccer is not an exception here uh, here in Santa Clara. As I said, there is a basketball game tonight. Now you get you get the chance to either look like Nostradamus or to to look a little bit silly because <laughs> we're talking on a Thursday. This actually, by the time folks listen to it, it is Saturday, and so they'll yeah. they'll know the result. But I'm going to ask you anyway. Yeah. What what are you expecting yeah. for the game tonight? Well, you know, I, I think that BYU opening as a 15 point favorite is telling about where these teams are at in their seasons right now. Uh, Santa Clara, I think, is it. It's the lowest point. There have been a lot of high points this year. Mm-hmm. They played their non-conference schedule the way that they should have. Came into WCC play 13-2. and two. They knocked off St. Mary's in Moraga. They'll get another crack at them next week. But they beat them on the road for the first time uh, since 2014, I think it and, was. And which BYU did not do this year. They, they got yeah, us on the road. BYU did not, too. I mean, it's St. Mary's. They're good year mm-hmm. in, year out. And that was a really great win. And then there have been some... Uh, some ups and downs, you know, some good wins and uh, some less than spectacular losses for Santa Clara. But right now they're in the midst of their first losing streak of the year. They've they lost three in a row, and BYU is ranked in the top 25 for the first time this year. First time and since Jimmer. First time since Jimmer for dead. That's correct. Uh, I remember Jimmer for dead. I, I picked them <laughs> to uh, I picked them to get to the final four in my bracket. He let me down. That, but, he he let a lot of us okay. down. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, 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 it's tough out there. But, but anyway, you, you look at, uh, at at tonight, I think BYU will win uh, pretty comfortably uh, because they're, they're so tough at home. Um, and Santa Clara right now, I think, is trying to, to figure out how to end the season strong. And, you know, I, I think that the game will really be decided in the first 10 minutes or so. That's kind of how Santa Clara's road games have been is, is sometimes they get away from them early and then they're not able to bounce back. But the reason they picked up that win at St. Mary's back in January was they got off to a strong start and they hung around. They built a lead and, and kept kept at it. But if Santa Clara lets BYU run out in transition, knock down a bunch of threes in the early going and the crowd gets into it, mm-hmm. it it's darn near impossible for just about anyone in the West Coast Conference to come back. And um, I, I think that'd be... Uh, a, a tough ask for Santa Clara. So if they are going to get the win, they, they have to control the few, first few minutes and they have to keep the crowd in check because uh, I know how rowdy they get up there in Provo. Well, we'll know by by the time I'm listening to this again, we'll know what has happened and, and I know what I'm rooting for, but but it's understandable. <laughs> You're on the other side. You're allowed to keep that rooting interest. Oh, yeah. No, I, that, that's what I think will happen, but I, that's not what I want to happen, man. I, I want them to go into the game against Pacific on Saturday with the fresh off of an upset and, you know, kind of have it be a, a turning point here at the end of the season with four conference games less. So, you know, that, that's certainly what, what I'm pulling for down here in, in the Bay Area. That's fair, my man. Well, Spencer McLaughlin, thank you so much for coming on the Cougar Tailgate today. Hey, my pleasure, Cole. Anytime. Thank you again, Spencer, for giving us a peek into Santa Clara basketball. And thank you again to Tom Hudson earlier today, the play-by-play man for Gonzaga, teaching us a little bit about that opponent that is coming up just about seven hours. A theme that ran through both of their interviews really was the magnitude of the Marriott Center, Mm -hmm. that it's so important for an away team to be able to sustain their energy and keep BYU from going on these giant runs where the fans can really impact the course of the game. Right. We kind of hope that the fans will impact the course of the game. And so what what do we got planned for the game tonight? What's what's a little extra incentive? If sure. if the number 2 team in the nation isn't enough to get you in the seats, <laughs> if experiencing, you know, weather in the teens and camping out isn't enough to get you there, what else what else do we have? We are bringing in a super fun halftime show actually there's gonna be a if you love dogs which you should because dogs are amazing there's a dog show christian and scooby i believe 
believe he Aww. was on America's Got Talent. So Sounds if right. you're more of like a pop culture person. <laughs> um, but we're also going to be able to recognize our seniors, which is something we haven't really had for a number of years. And this year we have seven. Whoa. Yeah, seven seniors. And some of them are names that you immediately recognize. Some are role players, but going to be the last time you're ever going to be able to see Oli Childs play on the Marriott Center court. So oh, sad. And a TJ Hawes, same way. I mean, there's so many guys that have been such like mainstays of this team. Dalton Nixon. Well, Dalton will be there. Yeah. He'll be there, there to support. But <laughs> um, And Jake and Zach and Evan Troy and Taylor Mon, those are... Our senior guys. They're going to walk out with the little roses and their family and things <laughs> yep, like that. Yep, That's the, the senior night jazz. Senior night. There's going to be a blanket like presentation for each of them. And yeah, it'll be a good time. There you go. Just one more reason to come out to the game and also, of course, to cheer on the Cougars uh, in the seniors last game. And as we prepare to head down to the WCC tournament, we're getting ready. You know, there's there's one more actual game. It feel because it's Gonzaga. It does feel like the regular season's over. Yeah. Pepperdine's next week. We'll talk about <laughs> that next week. And then we're gonna stay on the air because there's gonna be a WCC tournament that BYU will play in. And after that, there's an NCAA tournament that it seems like BYU yeah. will likely be playing. In. I mean, of all things, keep going the way they're going. One hundred percent, they're in. Here's a question for you, Cole. Yeah. As we get to the tail end yeah if you could only pick one a win against gonzaga tonight or a win against them in the championship of the wcc tournament what are you taking Ooh, so i if i get to pick i'm taking it in the tournament because i think that that's just less likely to happen and so i'll trust the boys to just get it done tonight on their own without me magicking it (laughs) into existence (laughs) so then i just get what a politician's (laughs) answer my goodness but yeah i mean that's but if you get it in the wcc tournament um we it means you would have won, and so that's an automatic berth. There yeah. is still, I guess, because we're technically a mid major. Yeah. There's a possibility that BYU isn't in the W in the NCAA tournament, but if so, if you get it there, it's guaranteed. Hundred percent. And I, but <sighs> but if you got it here, it's home. It's the it seniors. Is home. It's... I know I want it for the seniors, but I also would just love to have that WCC title. We've never gotten one. Seems like Gonzaga always gets it, and mm-hmm. I'm sick of it enough. So. We're coming on 10 years in the WCC. A good basketball team for all 10 of those years. Nothing right. to hang your head over if you're a BYU fan, yep. and yet not a single conference championship. Right. I would just love, I would love to take that trophy from Gonzaga's cold dead hands. That's all. That's, That's all. right. That's, so that's if I'm can... picking, I'm picking in the tournament, although I desperately want to win. More than anything, I would love I would love it to be close going into the last four minutes of the game when we do our turbulence. Oh, yes. I will say last year we were down by like 20 points. And turbulence just doesn't have doesn't have the same hype up quality when you're yeah. down by 20. <laughs> so it, it's it's good for a couple baskets in a row. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. Not 10. <laughs> Yeah. So BYU, but they'll they'll do their thing. Um, and as always, when the question is either or, the answer should always be just por qué no los dos. Let's yeah. let's take out both of them. True, true, let's, true. Let's true, take it true. all. Let's. let's... <laughs> we will be talking about Pepperdine next week. We'll recap what happened with Gonzaga and also be looking forward to that that inevitable WCC tournament and the new the stylings of it we got plenty more to talk about as we head into march the best time of the year if you're a basketball fan at the college level but as for today that wraps up our conversation we are a production of byu radio if you missed any of the show today remember to check out the podcast anywhere you get your podcasts over there at sydney carlson i'm cole wissinger gonzaga is tonight and go kooks